I want to welcome everyone to the last of our Spring Ahead lectures, Shaping Typography. Um, I'm Gloria Condrup, and I'm the um, Executive Director of the Hoffman's Milken Center for Typography. I have, of course, my moderator is Rory Tatum, who is a faculty member at Art Center, where he teaches generative type and generative design. Rory also co-founded and serves as Creative Director at Numbers, a design studio specializing in type design, identity design, and illustration projects. Now, if I can introduce, and thank you, Roy, again, because now we're entering areas of typography where I might not be the most comfortable, but Roy is. And it is my pleasure, though, to introduce Ted Davis, our speaker today. And this is from your bio. He's an American media artist, designer, educator, based in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, since 2010, he ta has taught interaction design and coordinates the, I love this, the HIC slash HGK International Master of Design Program within the Visual Communication Institute, right, at the Basel School of Design, Hakeschule für Gestaltung und Kunst. And I, I have to say that um, Leah Hoffmitz Milken, who was, the, who's the center's founded, also attended Basel. So there's a really wonderful connection there. Um, he, creative coding, which is what Ted will talk about, enables us to design it in a generative method uh, where form can be brought to life and influence with interaction. Um, he's gonna ex exploring alternative outputs, inputs ranging from our bodies to laser. This talk will share a selection of your typographic works from personal research, teachings, collaborations, and installations. I'm gonna stop my video. I'm gonna mute myself and say, welcome, Ted. It's a pleasure. And thank you again, Roy. Okay. I hope everything is moving and you can see my screen. Yep, looks great. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation and introduction. Um, I'm going to be giving a introduction to projects that are self-initiated, research uh, that I'm bringing into the classroom, playing with type and code in a variety of ways. So this little intro here is kind of an homage to a project that I did 10 years ago, almost to the day. Uh, I don't know if I'd call it project, but a just like a snippet of, of code that was to help me design a poster. So the idea was um, that I was going to let the computer sort of decide where the type should sit and, and sort of help me create compositions that I wouldn't have otherwise thought of myself. And I called this script make me a poster.php. And so I would have to refresh the screen every time I wanted to see a new composition. In the lower right is uh, that was the year I also started teaching, and I created this project, Scannerator, five billion zillion. And basically, it was kind of an analog equivalent, I'll rewind real quick, uh, where you just kind of pumped a vacuum in a box, it moves shapes around, there's a scanner that collects that composition. And so it was like getting into creating generative tools to help us design. Uh, about halfway in between... Uh, 10 years ago and today, there was a poster I created which used visual feedback in processing as sort of the main method uh, to create it. And essentially what this did was it sort of fed the image back in on itself using uh, code, using generative means to try and produce something that I wouldn't know exactly how to create myself by hand. So it's you sort of set up this environment, you build a mini tool for your, for your intention, and then you play with it and produce thousands, hundreds, thousands of outputs, uh, because that's what the computer is amazing at, is just producing outputs. And so in, in generative means, we can just produce, 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 and then we have to be a human and look at each of those and decide, hey, is it better if it goes in this direction or this direction? or was this output surprising, or was this one surprising? And so you can see the finished poster on the right and on the left, you can see, yeah, sort of a, a series of steps that I took to get there where you can slowly see it getting closer and closer to that direction as I um, started influencing it more and more to produce those results as I, as I saw them. 
but I'm going to walk back in and bring you through a handful of projects, um, both independent and, and teaching. Basil JS started in 2012 when one of our bachelor students wanted to program an InDesign for their project on the Martian Chronicles, and none of our faculty had experience programming in InDesign, but we were familiar with the work of Julia Laub and Benedict Gross, who had done a diploma project on that exact topic, programming in InDesign. And so Benedict Gross was invited for a workshop for programming in InDesign, and he realized uh, how much code was necessary just to show a rectangle on the page. And he realized there was a library processing JS, which was helping convert processing code to the browser in JavaScript. And he sort of borrowed some of those functions and gave a workshop that tried to simplify the process quite a bit. And we realized it had a lot of potential. And so we spent a year developing it and adding as many processing functions as we could to, to work in InDesign. And uh, about seven years later, we're almost done with 2.0. It's been uh, quite a while in process uh, due to open source. Um, life happens, other projects happen, but this is pending. And there's all kinds of amazing features that have been corrected and are, are a part of this. So um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. But what is Bazel.js? Essentially, it brings generative design into the environment of InDesign. So InDesign, all of the Adobe software can be programmed by JavaScript. And typically, I think people would use it to, to make um, catalogs from a database, or it was a sort of niche uh, group who would need to, to code these documents or for, for special functions and tools. And we really wanted to make it approachable for designers because this is a like the comfortable zone for designers in our field. And what if we could generatively create things there? And so we tried to adopt as much of processing as possible because we're teaching that as well in our institute. And it has such a great language for, for getting beginners up and running with generative design. And one of the really exciting aspects of this is we get to have that choice between coding from scratch and then playing with things afterwards with your mouse, or you create some things manually and then add code to it. So it's, it's a bit like flash action script for anyone um, who played with those tools quite a while ago, this sort of ping pong back and forth between um, controlling it directly and letting the computer control it. So this has been around since 2013, and we've been teaching with it uh, since on our institute, giving workshops. Uh, we hear all the time of, of interesting book projects that have been used with it. 2.0 website is coming soon with some community. And I want to show you a few projects from the teachings here. So this was a redesign of Animal Farm, which looked at various um, statistics and information out there on the internet. Um, things relevant to animal farms are here, most known dictatorships in history, the Freedom Index, there was the Happiness Index, and they made a play between both sort of uh, classical data visualization and typography data visualization, because in Bazel.js, we can really control every line, every word, every character, and apply code to it. Pretty much everything that you can do in InDesign with the mouse, you can control by code as well. So this just gives you a, a time-lapse insight to that process. It's definitely running faster here than it does in real life. It can be a little frustra frustrating and force grabbing a coffee. Um, it's not the fastest environment, but for the trade-off of what it's doing for you, you can be patient or you can always silence it so you don't see the changes and then it goes much faster. But it's great when students document this, this workflow that we get to see the code and see what it produced. Another project investigated dyslexia. They had found verbal descriptions of what it meant to read with dyslexia and attempted to sort of capture some of those qualities in type on each letter, and then sort of had a feedback loop. Then they took some of their explorations and shared it with someone who they knew had dyslexia to see how was the reading of this material. And similar to some font explorations in recent years, uh, just adding this extra contrast can can help uh, focus the eye. And so it's a, 
yeah, it's open. How, how generative does it look? How random does it look? This was a thesis project exploring uh, specifically Bazel.js and generative typography, which involved a on-demand printing system. And so it went through and had a manifesto that was um, setting up uh, the text generatively affecting it, sending it to a Xerox printer, and then you could walk away with a, a small poster from that generation. Uh, this is the manifesto that was part of this project and sort of really looking at all of these different aspects of typography and just what could generative means offer to them. This is a project hot off the press that last semester looked at gender equality index within the EU. And so one of the great things of Bazel.js is grabbing data from the internet. You can pull from, from um, offline files from Excel, or you can grab live internet data. And so in the class, uh, often recommending students go and search for a form of data that they want to describe and talk about, get it into InDesign to make a generative book, and then you have the choice of, of doing uh, different kinds of data visual visualization, or you can apply it directly to the type and influence um, position, or of course the letter forms as well. In the first year, this is looking at our library within the academy, our media tech on the, on the eighth floor, and looking at the book collection that are separated by different institutes and sort of using this as a data source to see what can we make with a small book about books regarding their metadata. Uh, two more projects hot off the press from this last semester. Uh, two groups wanted to look at audio and typography. And so we found a way to analyze audio and get a, a sort of, of time-based reading throughout the whole song. And in this case, they manipulated the type based on sort of the loudness throughout the song, trying to see if they could sort of see the music in their type. This was another project that played with danceability and other factors that can be extracted from music through computer means. And then found visualizations to try and match the, the songs that they were looking at. In a workshop a few years ago, there was a, it was about generative magazine covers and this student wanted to have a scream magazine. So the louder you yelled when you pressed print for the magazine, it would change graphics inside. And we found a workflow that you could go from processing to analyze the microphone and send it as a live input into InDesign. We have this experimental live rendering mode, uh, which you have to learn. You have to make sure you know how to stop it. Otherwise it runs infinitely but it opens up all kinds of weird possibility that we can live influence our documents from data input. Or in this case, when we first made Bazel.js, we thought it would be great to advertise that you could build a game inside of it, uh, which is not the most efficient use of it. So we kind of quickly took it down and made a, a better trailer, but I think it's a really untapped source to create an app store and give designers games inside of their their favorite tool. Yep, so 2.0 is coming soon, uh, eventually soon. There's all kinds of fun features. We can play with type forms. You can dig through the GitHub and find the develop. It's, it's all there open source. You can stay up on the latest. You can also send a ping and I can share some resources for how to already start playing with 2.0. In other projects uh, for something completely different, Glitch is what I ended up spending my master's thesis on in uh, about 12 years ago, 2008 to nine. And I was really interested in what the difference was between a digital and analog image. Uh, I was really surprised how many references to the analog we're still using in the digital. And so I had just done this random experiment of dragging and dropping an image over text edit and found this scrambling text uh, which for a while I was calling text edit remixes, just going through and changing ones to two, two to three, and found out I could influence the image from this layer. Uh, eventually a friend showed me the word glitch from a project, and then that opened up this whole domain of, ah, okay, there's musicians, uh, visual artists who have been playing with this concept of glitch uh, for years. At the time, 
the main way that we could see a digital image from an analog image might be through small artifacts. Like if you emailed a picture and it became low res, then it's kind of like the transparency versus opacity of a window. If it's perfectly clean, we see right through it and I can see the landscape out there. If there's a crack or it's dirty, all of a sudden the medium is apparent and it says, hey, there's a window between me and whatever I'm looking at outside. The other fascinating thing it opened up was all of our digital media uh, has both a surface and a structure. And we're spending 99% of the time just looking at the surface, uh, pictures of food, family, vacation, everything. And the computer is looking at this structure, these ones and zeros that can be interpreted in different ways. Uh, and it's spending about 99% of the time there. But it's getting really interesting because through machine learning, deep learning, the computer is spending a lot more time looking at the surface of an image. And we have all sorts of tools available to, to play with the structure. So in that thesis, I discovered like all of our media is speaking the same language. They don't care if it's an image or a movie or a text. And I could do weird things like throw text inside of an image, which became one of the main tools of that thesis, text to image which lets you just type anything, any language, any character set, uh, glyph, and it puts that text inside of the image in what's known as the body. There's sort of the headers, the information about an image, and the body is like the guts and the, the actual contents of the image. And so I could put this text inside of there and find a whole new way to produce an image. Uh, it's producing an image through text. And so people... Uh, use this in all kinds of weird ways, analyzing Bjork albums, their, their significant others' names, trying to pull meaning from it. Uh, it. It taught me a lot about databases. I quickly had to, to deal with tens of thousands of images and texts and learn how, how to sort these kinds of things and play with this. And it's sort of a, a method and, and technique that's stuck around for years because it's infinitely possible to, to play with this um, combination. So for almost 10 years, I've had the, the luck of getting to teach a glitch course every year where I walk people through my methodology with the JPEG. And then I open up the gate and say, go find your own file format. And a few of those years, it's been focused on geometry or minimal or typography for three years. And so I'll show you a few of those projects from the typographic realm. This was one that played with a consumer scanner printer device that instead of being a flatbed pulls it and realize they could do all sorts of nice manipulations in that process. So uh, this aspect of glitch is a lot about just embracing error or finding out where can you introduce errors into your workflow. So it ends up being along the lines of Xerox or scanner art. This was the type specimen they created for it. They named the font the name of their HP all-in-one device. And it's, uh, yeah, it ends up creating, I mean, glitch is a lot about glitching our perception. So it can be this infinite question, is this a glitch? Is this a glitch? But I think it's really important that we're just glitching our perception and playing with what do we expect and what can we create through this alternative methodology? So this is what this looks like typed out. And it's interesting playing with type and glitch versus images because you end up playing with this uh, legibility aspect. How abstract, legible do you want to keep the form, the letter form? So another format that was investigated was OTF. And finding out different ways to manipulate this data by opening it up, again, looking at the structure and playing with things. And eventually, everyone becomes an expert of their format. And in this case, realizing a few weeks later, opening up the same file, uh, it changed over time. And it could be that they updated their system, that they installed something else. And so it's a big, it's a lot about an appreciation for volatility of our digital files. Here, looking into OBJs and, and three-dimensional data that then gets 3D printed, where each of these letter forms sort of finished in a letter form, but could easily then be converted back into a, a vector graphic. There's a group this semester that's exploring a similar domain, but then is, is planning to bring this to a ceramic 3D printer that we have on campus, which will be interesting what gravity and mass and form introduced to this. 
This was an exploration with the GIF format. And that's what's exciting is every file format has its own aesthetics that they reveal when you kind of mess with them. And so this GIF, uh, they found it had this drifting uh, or delay kind of quality, decay quality as they played with it. And so it's interesting to look at uh, mainstream formats that we're used to playing with all the time or a sort of nostalgic or um, I forget the word, obsolete formats maybe that we can still access but aren't part of our regular computer use uh, because they each have such wild artifacts and aesthetics waiting. And I end with this uh, typographic exploration on this great quote, which fits it all quite well. We don't make mistakes, just happy little accidents from Bob Ross. This was also playing with a GIF, which enabled them to keep parts of the image stable while only playing with a certain part onward. The next project is Connect Type, which was initiated from an invitation for the Typo Janji in Seoul, this typographic Biennale, which in the in-between year has workshops. And so I was invited to give a workshop and the theme of the workshop was body. So I was thinking, okay, type and body, what do I think about when I think body? And I immediately thought on this Connect, which uh, was this revolutionary input in 2010 for the Xbox, which let you play video games with your body and sort of have this, this indirect um, non-physical by touching something interaction, which has this whole other interesting aspect. It's, it sort of produces a skeleton of your body, which there's a whole um, genre on YouTube of people who are interested in ghosts and phenomena, and they feel like they're, they're communicating with others through this skeleton uh, that they see on the depth camera. And I think this ties with the previous work, to me, this is a glitch, but it's all about a perception. Um, what do you see in that artifact? So what I wanted to do is play with this connect and play with typography. Uh, in processing, there's a great library called Geomerative, which lets us convert SVGs and fonts into points. And there's another library, Fantastic, which lets you take any of your points and build fonts from it. So you could sort of go in, change stuff, and go out. And so I built like a really rough proof of concept before the workshop saying, hey, this is my idea, just mapping points of the skeletal body to the letter form. Uh, quasi sporadic, because you don't have a lot of control over where in the letter form it connects, but just investigating what does that mean to, to control type with our body versus our hand, which we would normally do. So I borrowed, found a handful of Xbox Connects, the old ones, brought them, where it required having a controller on the computer, a filmographer, and an actor. And this is essentially the tool. It, it sort of let you designate which letter you're looking at at a time, and then you sort of press that letter. Your initial pose is how the letter starts, and then any movement from that initial pose is what distorts the letter. And so it started out with the idea that we were gonna uh, create fonts. I thought we would use our body to invent fonts and do one letter at a time. And then I discovered the Korean keyboard was mapped so differently than the US keyboard. None of the fonts were working. And so we quickly shifted to this puppeteering aspect, being able to animate the type with our bodies. And so instead we screen recorded uh, what, we were, what was happening and found different ways to use that in storytelling um, this was giving the workshop again at Motif in Ireland, and you can get a pretty good sense of what it means to act out type where you're, yeah, you're really puppeteering with your body. So, uh, and then I'm often exhibiting it uh, next to those workshops. And so it's always great having people come in who are not part of the workshop at all, just sort of seen what they can do to type and they can set which letter they use, set the starting point and, and play with the type. These are a few of the outputs. Wow, 
<laughs> yeah, so I thought this was a great example of using all the elements that they're provided and playing with scale, and it has this sort of James Bond like uh, manipulation of the layers. This next one played with this notion of when we are asked to, photo to pose for a photograph, everyone kind of goes into a unique face, whether it's with your whole body um, or your smile, that you end up doing something maybe artificial, maybe acted on the spot when you know a photo is being taken. So they wanted to play with, with these movements and capture how that might change type or how we might change ourselves through type. This project explored the word celebrate and fight and sort of the difference in motion of what could be celebration, celebrating. And again, fighting. So uh, we saw this a few videos ago, some of the this actor's motions, seeing what just different kinds of body movement could have as an effect on the type. And of course, when you provide someone a tool, when you create your own tools, you have no idea how people will use it and found people discovered the connect capturing worked perfect as a little VJ tool between silhouette and skeleton. The next project is audiographic alphabet laser letters. And I like alliteration. Um, when I'm type teaching type in the first year interaction, uh, we're teaching processing or P5 and basal JS. And you start with a group of about 25 or 26, and you hope to capture a third of them to want to focus in what we call medium or, um, yeah, it can be about generative design, filmography, um, new media. And so decided to play with type as a way to reach everyone who wasn't especially into code and play with audio because we get this, um, we get the chance to use our microphone to influence things, or it gives us a chance to visualize our music in unique ways. And in processing through libraries, Geomerative and Minim, it's really easy to, to get the points of type and influence it with um, audio. And so that year we, we had a sort of VJ event inside of our Kino on the campus, our cinema on the campus, uh, where there was a DJ and people use a wireless keyboard to see each person's work because there's 25 students plus myself. So each person is uh, responsible for a letter and then you can use the keyboard to jump between those letters and choose uh, which one you're looking at at the moment for VJ. And then that year I was uh, going to some media festivals and seeing some amazing laser installations in particular from Robert Henke which reminded me of this fascination with this uh, extraordinary light source, the laser, and was curious, how could we integrate this? Because the laser is a single point drawing device. Uh, so you have limitations of what you could draw versus a video projector where you can draw pixels, uh, whatever resolution it has. And so I was really curious if we could combine the two and kind of get the best of both. Could we have the complexity with this intensity of light. And so I wrote on a professional laser forum and learned about really expensive software that's used for like Super Bowl kind of events and a general interest, uh, but a lot of people not having time to explore that. And was fortunate that um, right around that time, a couple of years earlier, libraries became available to talk to lasers. So this was a particularly uh, perfect one for open frameworks. And so I got a a uh, cheap laser and a projector and put them next to each other. You have to be so careful with your remaining eye, super powerful lasers. Uh, and then just sort of did experiments of combining these two elements. First kind of rough, uh, trying to map them over each other, playing with different solid shapes versus line shapes, and then slowly realizing, okay, hey, the less you do, the slower it goes, the more you can really take advantage of um, this popping quality that the laser provides. And then did some more tests of, of figuring out how it could make this accessible to students because uh, we needed to use open frameworks for the laser. This was testing out different glyphs, 
making sure the idea could work, and then sort of built a faux library and processing to just let people put an X in front of their primitive shapes, line, rect, stroke, uh, to control the laser in the end. So each student again had a letter assigned to them and they generated their sketch with type, audio influencing it, and then had this option to choose which parts of the character would be influenced by, by the laser. So this video is online, you can watch it in full. I'm just gonna scrub a bit through it to give you an impression of, of some of the forms and, and where and which ways they played with complexity and the video image here sort of leaving a trail with the video from the laser, using it in kind of a sparkling manner. Here really playing with perspective and this three-dimensional quality we can play with. I'm not doing it justice going through quickly, just wanted to make sure you see enough that then you wanna go watch the video in whole and, and take your time with it. This was really interesting, sending too many points to the laser that it starts to collapse on itself. And then you end up getting maybe some three-dimensional forms. You can really hear the laser if you're sending too many forms because it's um, Galvo motors that are moving little mirrors to, to position the, the beam. And so they start to make kind of a squeal and you start to feel sorry for the device if you send it too many lines. But it's really interesting to see, to see what it can do. Um, then one year later, I explored anaglyph and 3D glasses because there was a library in processing. So it was interesting to see what's possible in three dimension. And then the next year, there was an interest to go back to the laser. And so we revisited the project. Um, now with experiences from the first round. Yeah, and continued to explore what does this mean? This, um, I like to call these alternative outputs, these possibilities beyond uh, what we're seeing on the laptop screen or a projection. What other kinds of displays can we really play with? Yeah, so I'll walk a bit through. Some people could get away with more laser shapes if they weren't drawing too many points. Again, with some three dimension. Having the audio affect the laser image in this case. Yeah, and, and really getting to, to try and figure out uh, how much is too much and, and really where do you want to highlight uh, a sketch? Where do you want to, which part of the type do you want to highlight with this laser? Okay, I'll slide through those. Yeah, if you look up laser letters one and two, you can find these full videos. X, Y, Z, and then I play with the last letter. Okay. Uh, speaking of alternative outputs, uh, I want to go into a project XY scope, which is based around this device, the oscilloscope, uh, which is typically found on the workbench of electrical engineers or any kind of tinker playing with electronics. It's often used to fix electronics, uh, looking at waveforms of voltage and, and energy feeding into it. But it's also possible to control this beam, uh, something I was seeing over the years from the demo scene to mushrooms to quake, uh, people figuring out how to control this unique cathode ray tube, which is sending a beam, an electron beam, from the back of the tube to the phosphorescent-like front and energizing it. So you get this really unique glow uh, that's such a different light source than our, our laptop screens are. So I was struggling for a few years trying to figure out how to play with this device and uh, Joost van Rossum uh, gave a talk at AT Typey um, about sonifying letters. He was really interested to hear what letter forms, what serif, sans serif sounded like. And so he had figured out a way in Python to generate wave files of the letter forms and sort of explore what these sounded like. And I was lucky that our master students were really curious to have a workshop on Drawbot, which he's created. It's sort of like processing, but with Python. And so we invited him to Basel and we played 
in my studio with his waveforms going through some audio gear, because in the end, you're sending audio signals, uh, audio into this device in order to activate it. So if it's audio, you can add some audio effects and see what kind of influence those have on the letter form. Um, as we walked to dinner, I mentioned my struggle trying to talk to this device and he could break it down in such a simple way, just saying any horizontal movement has to be on the left audio channel to the device. Any vertical movement has to go to the right audio channel, uh, which, yeah, suddenly went kind of ding uh, while we were having dinner and afterwards ran to my studio and changed a couple lines of code and then I could control this device. Maybe you can hear a little bit of this sound. I have it on fairly quiet. It's not the most pleasant sound, but you can see sort of how these waveforms, these sort of wave tables or oscillators that get sent to the oscilloscope look like when you're drawing different forms from a square to a circle, to triangle, to a spiral, how these, how you end up translating these vector movements into audio. So I changed some lines, it worked. I could suddenly draw anything on this device. Uh, it was a big Eureka without a bathtub and started playing with typography, playing with vector shapes, um, exploding things in 3D, copy pasting my code from one sketch to another and realizing I needed to make this into a library so that others could, could play with this as well. And for myself, as it developed and got better and better, I could just reference this library in my code. Uh, so I learned how that worked and this became XY scope, which um, is designed for talking to vector displays, multiple kinds of vector displays. It's open source and processing. It comes with examples to draw. And what you're hearing, you're hearing just faintly, is an Easter egg that's on the video. So if you have an oscilloscope, you could watch this video and you'll have a special image. I won't tell you what it is. You'll have to hook it up and see. You just plug it in to such a device. Uh, it comes with examples for hooking up to a connect, which gives you a great skeletal um, silhouette of your body. Examples for playing with a webcam, as well as loading video or um, siphon, which can come from other VJ software into it, as well as examples for typography and clocks. And it's been growing over the years. And it sort of pulls from what I learned during laser letters, that it's possible to use these primitive shapes and just put an X, Y in front of it. And then you're, you're sonifying this shape and it can go to the oscilloscope. So there's a handful of vector displays that are really interesting to draw on. This is a Vectrex, a video game system from the 80s, which you can modify to bypass the video game aspect and control the beam, which has this, some people call it like a spaghetti vision because it has these really nice uh, thin lines for what you draw. And about two years ago, added code so that you could control an RGB laser, which is a different way of talking to it than in laser letters, here you can send custom frequencies and waves to the R, the G, the B. So you can really create wild uh, patterns and, and combos uh, along with the form itself. And one of the most fascinating aspects of this is uh, what's known as additive synthesis. It's this taking one signal and adding other signals on top of it. So here, one of the signals is vector hack which is a biannual gathering of, of people obsessed with, with vector graphics, uh, laser oscilloscope um, taking place in Zagreb and Ljubljana. And taking that text as, as one signal and then adding another signal on top of it. So I'm adding different oscillating uh, forms at different frequencies, which end up influencing the type in a way that would be quite pretty hard. I wouldn't know exactly what to do in After Effects or another program, where to put the motion points, how to control it. Uh, but it's a path of just discovery, playing with multiple signals overlapping, changing their frequencies, their sound until you, you land on results that are, are really interesting. So one of the main projects I've done with that technique was for the Typo John G uh, biannual the following year where they could find eight oscilloscopes 
And I created this work called Also Body, Also Typo. And what it does is it takes you as your body into the system. It takes letter forms and then it merges these two waves together. So you end up kind of um, maybe very literally play with this idea of body and type. And this is what it looks like in another installation where I have better documentation of it. You would walk up to the input device where it captures your, your silhouette. Uh, as long as you're moving in front of it, it's capturing, capturing. And the minute you walk out of the camera, it takes about two seconds buffer and continues to play that movement. And then on the first screen, it combines typography as a small high pitch on that signal. So here we can see a T uh, sort of becoming like a texture of the person's body. On the third oscilloscope, it's the opposite. The typography is the base carrier signal and the person's body becomes like a small texture at a high frequency, small volume on top of it. So depending on what you did in front of the camera, you can sometimes see yourself really well in this typography. And on the last display is uh, the original footage, but looped so you can enjoy what it looked like, just this translation, this visual translation to, to glowing vectors, or it can be a great spot to see others interact with the piece, um, just seeing how they see themselves through this through this translation. Yeah, and I think I spoke like a bit of a motor mouth and kind of ran quickly to make sure I could get through everything. And so this last slide is kind of a meta slide uh, to demonstrate what I've been obsessing with the last two years, uh, this environment called P5 Live, which is a live coding collaborative, like remote collaborative environment for P5JS. This, this web iteration of processing. And um, yeah, so what it lets us do is it lets us uh, play with creative coding, generative graphics, play with typography while live coding and changing things on the fly, having instant updates, full screen. We can VJ with it. So I'm um, hopeful that as venues start to open up, we can have more typographic visuals like Dia's A-Track uh, which is really inspirational. And yeah, that, that type finds its way into the club through this sort of algo rave means. So this is a tool that's out there uh, online, P5 Live, and you can use it to remotely collaborate. It was useful during COVID times to work with students between computers. And uh, yeah, that sort of pulled me away from some of the vector graphics, but slowly they're gonna find their way to hang out together. So thank you for your attention. Um, happy for any questions you might have. Cool. Thanks, Ted. It's super, super interesting to see all of that stuff like together in one space. I've seen a lot of it online, obviously, but I think like some of the documentation videos I hadn't seen, really, really cool to see. Um, Thank you. I think there's one quick question that is kind of connected to something that I was wondering too. Um, so I'll kind of fold it in to what I was about to ask. Mm -hmm. Um, I think like, so I've been using, I, I reached out to you at the end of last year about Basil JS, um, and I've actually been using it in, in the class for the last semester. Like I've started in spring. It's been really cool to see like the students reception to it. Like obviously learning a little bit of processing and then jumping into Basil JS has made it so that, um, students can like feel like comfortable in the environment that they're usually making their work in, but also add in a lot of this generative stuff. I think the examples you are showing from your students are, are really, really nice. Um, one thing that has been kind of a question that has been coming up recently is about the relationship between processing and Basil.js. Um, and so the question in the chat is like, is the work that you are showing using um, the 2.0 version and then kind of related to that, I noticed some projects you had mentioned were like somehow connecting processing in Basil.js. Could you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about like what's new in the second version, if that like connectivity is possible or how that was kind of achieved? Sure. Yeah. So one of the, the key things in 2.0 is bugs, 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 uh, like fixing all kinds of bugs and then yeah. adding functionality that didn't exist yet. So um, 
yeah, there's, there's a whole laundry list of things that just, we didn't have time to in 1.0 that over workshops over time realized, um, yeah, we want things like create outlines and play with text to points kind of functionality. So the projects that use that are taking advantage of 2.0 when this was introduced, you could do pretty much anything we're doing in 2.0, you can still do directly in InDesign. You just have to look up the, the super long Jongware website or others that go through every single function and figure out how to do it. And then uh, we often, okay, figure out that's how you do it. And then, okay, this should be its own function just for doing that. Um, so 2.0 is fixing a lot of things. It's adding a lot of features. I think the biggest feature, like the the number one thing that that we should be just in beta with the website releasing it for is that we got rid of the B dot which at the beginning was a sore point of like, ah, but B dot is Basel, Basel, uh, JS. But by getting rid of it, uh, one of our contributors, Timo, figured out how to get rid of it. And what that means is it becomes really close to P5 JS, which came out like in the, as we were getting into this, like Basel JS uh, kind of appeared just as cryptographer was being retired. Um, and so it offered, it went from InDesign Illustrator. So now we could play in InDesign in a different way. And we were aligning ourselves with processing because that was such a big tool that we were using. And there was always kind of a question, how much should we do stuff the P5 way? Because it's inspired by processing. It's not one-to-one -one processing. Or do we stick to exactly what processing does so that we, we make sure people aren't screwed up between uh, some of these possibilities? And the more I've used P5 in the last few years, and, and all of us have used it, the more we see the alignment being so nice between those two because they're both speaking JavaScript. And so the, we had examples to move a processing sketch into Bazel and you remove the B and you change a couple variable types. Um, but yeah, it, it's sort of like, we always wanna make sure it's, it's as compatible as possible with processing. And it's, it gets really exciting when you can take your code from InDesign and start playing with it as a website with P5. Yeah, totally. There's a super, I, it's, it's cool that you mentioned that because I've always seen like a really nice connection between scriptographer and Bazel JS, like both in terms of like the design of the, of the library, but also just like the ethos of the project feels like very similar. Um, one thing that was really cool about scriptographer was the kind of like pre bundled examples that they had that made it like really fast to get up and and running like with some of the stuff that just so you could kind of see like what the possibilities of the of the library were are there any plans for building out like a basil js repo or like any sort of like educational initiatives around like learning the tool or like spreading the tool um in that kind of realm yeah so we we've, we've always had a folder of demos that tried to demonstrate some of the aspects like playing with color in indesign playing with the mouse this looping environment um importing data like csv and uh those ended up in 2.0 got separated from the library because we realized hey it should be its own repository so we could edit those and update them and and i was i'm kind of a, i mean it was kind of decided that basil js would install separately than the examples, which I'm quasi against uh, because I think, yeah, it's nice to have them built into it, but of course it's a, it's a question. Not everyone needs it. Sometimes you just want the library. So yeah, with the 2.0 website, it's a big question of, of adding more teaching materials. Uh, I plan to add all of my teaching materials for, for Basil JS to it. There's others who have been giving workshops. And so we'll, we'll definitely have like a learning slash teaching part of the website to, to link to those repositories. Cause the, on the Bazel website, uh, the tutorials that we have are, are super out of date now. And there's so much more it can do that we could demonstrate what it can do that. Yeah. It's just, uh, takes so much yeah. time to add that documentation. Yeah, totally. I mean, the nice thing is that like students have been working with some of those examples and it's cool that it's a lot of times as easy as just deleting B dot from those examples and still having them work. So. I mean, yeah, it's totally like understandable. It's a ton of work, but I mean, still working. But I'll make sure you have really the nice. link because we have yeah. gone through and updated the examples. So those are 2.0 oh, okay. already, but they're just sitting in another repository, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would love to get that. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, one other quick question I was thinking about as you were presenting, um, do you think of like 
a project like Bazel JS as being a type of glitch, or do you see it more as like the formalization of that way of thinking and working that you've kind of been exploring over the last couple of years or 10 years, I think he said. Yeah, interesting. A glitch in which sense? Like it, it, in looking at the glitch work, it was like, mm -hmm. it seemed to be about subverting like the intended function of like something like a jpeg or something like a gif or um like using like misusing i guess you could say for lack of a better word like one format or technology mm -hmm. um do you think of the work that's being done in basil or even just like the project at like a high level as being like an extension of that work or like a formalization of that work because you're kind of creating a tool to do that type of work maybe mm -hmm. yeah I, yeah it'd be interesting uh in in one way it's it's maybe trying to glitch the designer to say hey you can code in this environment that you're comfortable in uh that was sort of one of the initial ideas was there's processing there's these different generative tools uh that might be such a strange domain because you just have to write by text and then something appears uh unless it's a visual programming language so this is like maybe subverting, glitching the designer to, to feel comfortable to generatively code in that domain. But then mm -hmm. it's it's equally maybe enabling because it's uh, to us, it's so much about not just the efficiency that you, then you can have 10,000 generative postcards, but, but just to get to try experiments that you would never do with the mouse. So um, that might be a glitchy result that you end up trying something that could be glitching the reader of the book as the like text slowly grows or fades out or shifts or does weird things over a hundred pages. Um, mm. It just opens up ex uh, possibilities that you just could do with the mouse. Uh, but you'd have to have a lot of patience. Yeah. So yeah, it's totally. maybe it, it's a, yeah, maybe it, it leans more in the spectrum towards enabling than, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's kind of cool to think about that as like, when I was seeing some of the student work, there was an interesting like connection between like some of the glitch work and the Basil JS work. So I was wondering like, mm -hmm. you know, how how formalized had that been that connection? Um, yeah, and maybe it's it's uh, through some of these tools it lets you work in a more free, unexpected way. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe you end up glitching yourself a bit by doing some code and being so surprised at the output versus. Uh, when you're with the mouse and changing something, you're seeing it in real time preview and you might decide, oh, wait, maybe I shouldn't put the slider further than that. And if you do it by code, you might accidentally run it and you see something crazy and then you say, ah, let's keep running with that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I like that serendipitous kind of stuff that happens. That's one of the nice things about working with code that I always try to encourage, I think. Mm -hmm. So yes, when you see me, it's almost <laughs> time to stop. But I have a question, Ted um, and, and Roy. I think this is really interesting and specific. I mean, there's so much that has to be imparted, and Roy will tell you this in a generative learning generative type, but do you offer or does the Basel School of Design offer specifically workshops on Basel JS? Yeah, we do. Or uh, anyone? Yeah, definitely. We have a winter workshop series that's focused on uh, different technical inputs. And there I teach a Basil JS input. So this is something that is offered. Uh, it's, yeah, the dates shift, but it's sometime between January into February that these are one week mm -hmm. workshops. Mm -hmm. That are open to any anyone who wants to definitely. sign up for it? Yep, yep. Okay. The world is welcome. And, and in the summer, we, we do a mixture of technical and Basel School of Design sort of um, typography and poster and design inquiry. And, mm -hmm. and there I do a week on creative coding. Will they be remote, Ted, moving forward? Or are they going to be? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. It's, it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, physical is ideal, but we're all getting so used to remote. And then it's a question if and how we can do hybrid because... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the students prefer to do physical and, and come to Basel and, and visit them. But of course, we're very open to, to remote participation. So yeah, if anyone's interested, they should simply get in touch. So I think uh, we have to say that's it for today, though, unfortunately, Ted. <laughs> but again, uh, for everyone who attended, thank you so much. Thank you again, Ted, 
Thank you yeah, again. Thank Laura. you so much for having and thank me. Thank you. Thanks to everyone again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.